I want to look at four teams right now that I think have a chance as, as we roll through this back half of the season based on their schedule, based on the way that they've looked so far, some of the things that they've already achieved on their resume, and then what could be in front of them. Like we could have some of these teams that are that are making noise as it relates to a playoff berth. I think that we know, and, and I want to caveat this, there's a lot of teams that could go to the playoff and are still alive for the playoff. This is not a list of like, who's alive for the playoff. This is a list of teams that maybe you haven't quite thought of, or maybe we have written them off and it's like, well, hold on for a second. So I've got four teams that here at the halfway point, we want to just take a closer look and say, Hey, they they've got a legitimate path. One might, might be fairly obvious, but we do need to revisit the, uh, them. This one is not the obvious one. But after last week, boy, it's hard not to th see at least a path for Louisville. So Louisville is my number one sleeper team so far this year. Um, unranked to start the year, and you got a first-year head coach. By the way, eerily reminiscent to what we had last year with TCU, with Sonny Dykes coming over from SMU. Lots of transfers and an ex experienced quarterback. I think that's really a, a resume that we're all starting to see and, and stumble upon that really works um, in terms of turning something around right away. I also love this element of Jeff Brom going home, right? So Coach Brom goes back to Louisville. He knows it. He understands it. He knows what can be successful there. And, and I think more specifically, alums of programs have a unique understanding of what the fan base wants, in particular ex-quarterbacks. Okay, I can, I can tell you exactly when I heard murmurs in the stands at Colorado. Brom can do the same at, at Louisville. He can tell you exactly what the sentiment was and the ebb and flow of the season and who you have to beat and, and who do they think is a great win. Those things shouldn't be overlooked in terms of just intimate, deep knowledge of a program and an institution and, and a place and a community and a fan base. Brom clearly has that at Louisville. I thought you saw that come to fruition last week. That stadium was incredible, electric. But it's not just all of those intangible things. You've also got a team that's playing at a pretty high level. I think the experienced quarterback helps, obviously. They had five takeaways. You've got to have those games in which you play over your head. TCU did that a year ago. I think we all remember some of those comebacks late in games. Oklahoma State, they came back uh, in a game. Now you've got this Louisville team that, that welcomes Notre Dame in. They get Notre Dame at a good point because Notre Dame just played two highly emotional games, won a loss at home to Ohio State. Then they go out and they, they beat Duke on basically the last play of the game. And, and so you've got this, this Notre Dame team that walks in and then they just lock the gates behind them. And that was an outstanding performance. They... they they did everything right. They used the momentum of the, the, the crowd. They, they used everything that was there at their disposal to win the game. They sack Hartman five times. They have eight TFLs. They were aggressive. Several of those, by the way, on key short yardage plays. They held Notre Dame to 50 yards rushing, and this is a team that needs to run the football, wants to run the football. You look at this, this team in totality, 14 takeaways in six games. That's fourth most in the country, so they're opportunistic. And their quarterback, Jack Plummer, yeah, he's a transfer, but was at Purdue to start his college career with Brom, and he was there for four years. He knows the system. Started at Cal last year, so then he gets experienced on the field, and now he's in his sixth year, and he started 31 games. And it's like he's flown totally under the radar. But, but think about that. You've got familiarity with the coach and the system that you're about to use. And you've got experience under your belt. Plus, they, 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 can, they can back him up on that offense with a quality run game. Uh, Jordan, I think I'm saying this right, Jahar Jordan is a really good back. Total home run threat. You saw that in that game. He's the leading rusher in the ACC. He's got over 100 yards per game, and he's averaging a little over, you know, almost seven and a half yards per carry. So all of this to tell you, this team is very good. Now it comes down to their schedule. You look at the rest of their year, and to me, their schedule is favorable to be a sleeper. They've got at Pitt. They got Duke. By the way, Riley Leonard still has that high ankle sprain. It's it's unclear when he's going to return. That's their toughest game remaining because then they got Virginia Tech, Virginia, and then at Miami. Now, Miami's ranking of 25, that might be a little bit flawed. 
They've also got Kentucky, which Kentucky and Miami could pose a, a bit of a threat, but you can see the path. You can see the path to them getting into that ACC championship game. And at that point, you're the ACC champion in a year in which the ACC has played really well. And in, in the year in which the ACC has six pretty good teams right now ranked, then you've got a chance to go to the playoff. Louisville, good sleeper pick right now, halfway for the college football playoff. All right, next sleeper pick for me. Also out of the ACC, watch out for North Carolina, okay? Because North Carolina is a team that at the beginning of the year, a lot of us, me included, just thought like, well, it's just not great. It's not a great team, but they've got a great quarterback. Well, let's be honest. Like, they're pretty good. I think their defense is, is decent. Um, they only have to be average because they have Drake May. The more I watch Drake May, the more I'm impressed. You know, like, I, I, I see this team, and it's it's hard for me not to just immediately think to myself, this quarterback can take them a long way. He's he's really good. So on, on this week's Breaking the Huddle, um, check it out. It's on FS1. Uh, it's a show that I do every single week. Check your local listings. It kind of bounces around. It's usually shoulder programming for some of those uh, weeknight games on FS1. Check check around for uh, Breaking the Huddle. Because on Breaking the Huddle, I'm going to do a breakdown of Drake May. And and by the way, later in the program, I'll, I'll do a little bit more of this. Drake is like the quintessential NFL quarterback. He's as good of a player as there is in the country. If Caleb Williams is not in a college uniform right now, Drake May is the clear number one pick in next spring's draft. He's that good. So he can carry, listen, if Caleb Williams is carrying USC, Drake May can carry North Carolina or, or any of the supposed weaknesses of Carolina. He can help them out. Now, they do have Amorion Hampton. He's averaging over five yards per carry on that offensive side. He had a 200-yard game, albeit against App State, but had a 200-yard game. The defense, like I said, all they need to be is kind of average mid, mid defense, if you will. So far, the answer is yes, they can play to that level. They're fourth in scoring defense in the ACC. They're sixth in yards. They don't need to be a top three defense because they have Drake May. This is the point. The offense got Tez Walker back from, from that, you know, and, and by the way, the NCAA did the right thing, but then they immediately like NCAA themselves by saying like, well, it was the institution's fault. They did not give us all the information. The NCAA is terrible. I mean, faster the NCAA goes away, the better for everybody in college football and really in all intercollegiate athletics. It was formed to protect the student athlete. Now all it does is hinder the student athlete. So anyways, Tez Walker back. Good for Drake May, May and North Carolina. And he's, you know, he's going to come back and don't look for him to make a huge splash right away, but incrementally, he's going to get better and better, get more in game shape and then be more of an impact. Now, Along with Louisville, they also do not play Florida State down the stretch. And by the way, Louisville doesn't play North Carolina. And guess what? North Carolina misses Florida State and Louisville. So these three undefeateds in the ACC are going to miss each other. So here's what North Carolina has. Big game against Miami coming up. Virginia, Georgia Tech, Campbell. <laughs> There we go. Duke, Clemson, that's going to be a tough one at Clemson and North Carolina State. This is probably the toughest road in the ACC, but if they can get through this, even if they were to lose at Clemson and still go to the ACC championship game and win, like they would have enough. So a good, again, a, a good sleeper team. Remember, TCU made it to the playoff last year as a non-champ with a loss. Now, remember, they went undefeated, and then Kansas State beat them. But, like, these teams can do that. Sleeper teams for the college football playoff, Louisville and North Carolina. Nobody is talking about them right now except us, except us. Now, let's get to the obvious one. The obvious one, and the reason I call this a sleeper team is because the way that they played in two weeks during September, everyone wrote them off. I'm talking about Alabama. Now, you can roll your eyes if you want, but Alabama is, at this point, going to be in my sleeper teams because of the fact I just mentioned. Everybody wrote them off. Texas beats them. They play terrible against South Florida, and everyone's like, well, they're not going to go to the playoff. And now you look up, 
They've found a bit of a rhythm, if you will. They've won games now with two starkly different styles. A game in which they basically completed like seven passes and just ran the ball to death against Ole Miss. And then a game in which they can't run it and have to throw it in order to beat Texas A&M. Watch out. Watch out. It's not a great division. We know that. It's not a great division. But one thing I do know is that Nick Saban will find a way to win. Remember, this is not a guy that has to play a very specific style in order to be successful. He's one of the only head coaches that I can remember in this sport that has won national championships, one at the top end of the sport with multiple different styles, multiple different assistant coaching staffs, multiple different recruiting cycles. This guy understands how to coach the game. He's out there to win. He's going to do whatever he can to win, whatever style and philosophy to win. And this is one of the reasons why I, I liked him. They're outside of the top 10. That to me makes him a sleeper. Fourth straight week there outside of the top 10. No one believes in this team because they don't have a high ceiling. They don't have that quarterback that they've had in the last four or five years. The offense is a, is a concern. I'll give you that. It's a concern. They're ninth in the SEC in scoring and more on that in just a little bit. But to me, Games like last week are not where they, they are going to find a lot of success. Against AM, they didn't run it very well, and they get, they're going to need to run it well down the stretch because Milrow is still not the quarterback that you can just leave out there on an island and say, okay, buddy, well, we're not going to give you the play action. We're not going to, you just have to win it with your arm. I just don't think that that's going to be a winning formula for Alabama moving forward. Jermaine Burton, by the way, Finally, they find a wide receiver. I felt like they were weak at wide receiver a year ago. And, and kind of finally, they find a wide receiver to break out. They've been waiting for that uh, for really two years since he transferred from Georgia. But Jermaine Burton looked really good. So Milrow found at least a consistent threat or hopefully a consistent threat on the outside. The defense has played well. Okay. And this is one of the marks of why I like Bama is because they're going to be in every game. They're second in the SEC in scoring behind Georgia. And basically they can win out, beat Georgia, and they're in. Like of all these sleepers, they all these teams control their own destiny. They get in as they're undefeated. But even with a loss, this Bama team, they're going if they win out. That would be a win over Georgia, a win over LSU. Like they're going to go if they win out. So then it becomes basically the LSU game. You look at what they've got remaining on their schedule. They've got Arkansas, Tennessee, an off week, LSU, Kentucky, Chattanooga, and Auburn. To me, none of those teams scare me with the way that they're playing right now and the way that they're built this year, except for LSU. I think it's a great thing that they've got LSU at home. But the, the bottom line is LSU is not going to stop Alabama. But with a limited offense... Can they go score 45 or more in order to beat LSU? Because LSU might score 45. That's the only one that makes me nervous for Alabama because of the style of game in which they're going to have to play in order to win. I don't know if they can hold them under 40 points, even with a really good defense. And Bama's defense is pretty good. They played well against Texas for the most part, held them into that game um, until the end when they couldn't get off the field. LSU is a little bit different, though. Like Daniels is playing at such a high level, such a high level. And that one's gonna that's what that one's gonna be nerve-wracking for Tide fans. Okay, so that's the third sleeper team. Here's the last one. I'm gonna take a little drink. All right. Folks, this one's way out of left field. I don't believe anybody has has contemplated this team. However, they're going to play, they do play, I should say, in a conference that that is getting a lot of attention. The narrative right now is that the Pac-12 champ is going to go to the playoff or should go to the playoff. I agree with that. I'll be one of the first ones to kind of champion that narrative, okay? And there's a team out there that, like, when you look at everybody's schedule down the stretch... It's pretty clearly the easiest road. And then you start to think to yourself, like, wow, like, is there best football in front of them? Yes. Yes, it is. Because I'm talking about 
UCLA. UCLA is going to be my fourth sleeper team. And, and, and here's the deal. Is it likely? Um, probably not. But it's a team that just beat Washington State and, and handled Washington State. And Washington State is a good football team with an experienced quarterback in Cam Ward. The defense just held Washington State to 10 offensive points. They were averaging 45 coming in. They scored a little bit more than that because they got a pick six, speaking of the Cougars. If you guys haven't seen Dante Moore play, you need to see him play. He's a very talented, true freshman learning on the job at quarterback. It did provide and has provided some growing pains, which you would expect from a true freshman quarterback. He threw a pick six against Utah. That was basically the difference in the game. They lose 14 to seven. He throws a pick six against Washington State. By the way, like they were driving before the half in order to really kind of cement their control of the game. And he throws a pick six and it changes the entire game. And now they're kind of in, in, a bit in, in a struggle. And yet the defense, their ability to run the football allowed them to continue to have success. They've got a really, really good defense. And this is the one thing that all of these offenses in the Pac-12, how are they going to react if they don't go out there and score 40 points? They're the number one defense in the country in yards per play allowed, the UCLA Bruins. That might even be a better metric than, than total defense. And in fact, I think it is because it's just a metric of like snap the football and play and who's the best on any given snap. Well, right now, the numbers suggest that it's UCLA, number one in the country, yards per play allowed, and they're a top 10 scoring defense right now. And by the way, that top 10 scoring defense is even with their quarterback giving up two touchdowns to the opposition. They lead the power five in takeaways per game. They lead the power five in rushing yards per carry allowed. This defense is legit. And so now I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, what if Washington, you know, has a bad day at the wrong time? What if Oregon has a bad day at the wrong time? Oh, this is interesting. They also run the ball. They run the heck out of the ball. And that will not be something that those other teams want to see in a championship game environment. If they can get past Oregon State this week in Corvallis, all of a sudden their schedule like is, is way easier than the rest of the Pac-12. This is what they have in front of them. They've got Oregon State and Corvallis this weekend. Really tough game, in particular for a young quarterback. That's going to be a knockdown drag out. Might be done in like an hour and 55 minutes if they run the ball as much as I think that they're going to run. Okay, then they're going to be at Stanford. They've got Colorado. They're at Arizona. They host Arizona State at USC, which, you know, like it's in LA. So, and I get it, like it's, but then, then they've got Cal. One, one is a rivalry game that can go either way. Like the SC, you can't just say like, well, they're not going to beat SC. It's a rivalry game. They could absolutely beat SC. I think that the toughest remaining game for UCLA is this weekend. If UCLA wins this weekend, watch out. Because now you're talking about a team that if they run the table and they win the Pac-12 with just one loss, they get through this, they beat Oregon State, they would have a Washington State win, they would have an SC win, they would beat whomever they face in the Pac-12 championship game. If they go to Vegas and beat, like this week's winner, Oregon-Washington, let's say one of those teams goes, and they go in there and beat them, UCLA is going to the playoff. So, so now it's about, can your quarterback get better? Can your run game continue to get better? Chip Kelly has quietly built something very good. Last year, they were a tremendous football team. Everyone said, well, yeah, they've got, they had veterans, right? You've got DTR and you had Zach Charbonnet and they were all veterans. Well, now you bring in a transfer at running back and, and you've got a true freshman at quarterback and the defense is legit. I kind of I like UCLA. Watch out for UCLA. If you're looking at a team that is like off the map, nobody talking about them, UCLA, because that schedule is by far the easiest to navigate of any of the Pac-12 contenders. So if you're looking for maybe some long shot odds to get into the playoff, look no further than the UCLA Bruins. U C uh. Anyways, a little late clap. Thank you for watching the Joel Class Show YouTube channel. And if you like this clip, make sure to like it and subscribe to the channel. And you can stay up to date on all of my college football coverage.